All right, hey folks, Steve Vai here. And uh, I was asked by the good folks at Sweetwater for GearFest, which I know that uh, you are all attending digitally or online, uh, to do a little video for you about myself, about the evolution of my guitar style. All right. I don't think I've ever actually done a video like this. So what I'm going to do is just kind of talk about how I've observed my guitar style uh, evolving through the years. Oh, I also wanted to mention that uh, my, the rig that I'm playing here, I have my black Onyx Pia and I'm going into some pedals and then I go into my Synergy preamp and then out through Synergy power amps into um, the various speakers that I use. So it's important to note that in the beginning, the first thing that I had that looked like a guitar was a broom. That's right. And that broom got a beating. And uh, it, because I would be in my teenage Long Island room, listening to music and just jumping around the room, making believe I was a real rock star. Okay. This is every, every from the ages of like nine to 61. <laughs> well, maybe not that long. Uh, but it was never apparent to me that I could actually play the guitar. <clears throat> I think because the guitar was so cool, you know, and I was just this kid from Long Island and I had no idea that I had the right to play it, you know. But then there was a fateful day where I visited a friend and he sold me his $5 Tesco Del Rey and it had a whammy bar and it was like heaven in a cup. And I played that guitar. I didn't know anything about the instrument. And I didn't tell anybody. <clears throat> and I would just sit in my room and just play, trying to connect notes, you know. And I remember I went out and bought a Led Zeppelin songbook. And the first thing that I learned was... When I, when I played those notes, I thought I arrived. I mean, it was like a paradigm shift in my life. I was like, I could play music on the guitar. Of course, it didn't sound or look like that. But in any event, a very dear friend of mine that I was growing up with, his name is John Sergio. He lived a few doors down and he was a real music head for progressive rock and everything. And uh, he played guitar and his guitar teacher was Joe Satriani. That's right, Joe and I grew up in the same town. And he was about four years older than me and he was always cool and he was always great and we all worshiped him and took lessons from him. And when I arrived at Joe's house by the time, uh, my guitar had broken strings. I was down to like playing on three strings, you know, cause I didn't, I didn't have strings. I didn't know how to string it, nothing. So eventually I uh, got enough money to buy some strings <laughs> and uh, I didn't get them at Sweetwater though. I did get him at Matthew's Music at Roosevelt Field. And I went to Joe Satriani with a pack of strings and a guitar. And this was uh, amazing for me. It was, it, it was my entire focus. And I was really into the 70s rock, you know, Led Zeppelin, Queen, Kiss, Aerosmith, all those kinds of things. And I practiced my lessons religiously. I kind of became uh, neurotic about it, you know and completely forensic and did probably 10 times the amount that I was asked to do because I just loved it. I would sit in my room and every, every little thing that I was able to do uh, that was new, was, it was like a discovery, you know? And my favorite thing, and this, is, this holds true today, and maybe you, uh, you, you can uh, understand this in your own life, um, it was really uh, the creative process of coming up with an idea for something that I couldn't play and then working on it and working on it until I could play it. Now this was, uh, it became addictive, you know, because finally there was something that I could do and uh, I just felt good about myself. But I was also very interested in compositional music at the time because my parents had brought home West Side Story. So I actually started to learn how to compose before I started playing the guitar. 
And I was taking a great music theory class in high school that taught me everything that I could possibly want to know about music theory, but I wasn't applying it to the guitar. Joe had the same teacher, and Joe was showing me how to apply it to the guitar. So there was a period of time there for many years, probably the ages of 13 to uh, from the time I went to college, um, where I practiced incessantly, and I was very regimented. I would take my lesson and I would practice it religiously. And it just involved things like exercises. These simple kinds of exercises. And as far as scales go, I was fascinated with the tonal quality of them and practiced them like in every key, up and down, every mode. It took hours. As a matter of fact, I created a schedule and usually it was like one hour of exercises, one hour of scales, one hour of chords, and then I'd repeat it, and then I'd repeat it again. Uh, and based on how much time I had, I would, I would allocate at least an hour or more to just sitting and playing and just jamming. And I was learning all of the riffs that were so interesting and cool to me from all the bands that I was uh, into at the time. And it was always fascinating when I learned them. I might assume that this is the evolution of my style. I try to think back to where the split took place from just wanting to play like somebody to consciously looking for unique riffs that I hadn't heard before. That always seemed to be something that resonated with me because I actually never felt good enough to play authentic blues I wasn't, at, at that time, I wasn't even really into the blues. Uh, they seemed too simple. I started to get into very complex music uh, at one point. Of course, I appreciate them now. And everything I do has some kind of basis in a blues scale, mostly. So I was really fascinated with these tonal qualities of the scales and very regimented practicing. And I would uh, create these lists. And also, uh, eventually, I, I wrote a book it's called the Steve Vai 30 Hour Workout. And it basically outlines what I used to do as a kid, you know. Um, there was a nine hour workout, which was my foundation that I tried to hit every day. And then there was the 30 hour that would, of course, not in one shot. But uh, if I had to attribute the way that I play today and the way that I perform and the music that I write, I would say I would attribute it to visualizations I had as a kid because I would sit and listen to music, I'd get into a, a room when nobody was around, I'd listen to the music, I'd lay there and I'd imagine I created a pictorial, a mental pictorial. And I was probably, this was between the ages of nine and whenever, you know, it was, it was a constant kind of visual and what this visual was was me performing as an adult and being completely effortless, seamless, the way I moved was elegant, the way I played was, uh, was engaging and melodic and musical, and I was playing to an audience of my friends and I was lifting them up. Okay, so you know when you're a kid you're allowed to dream, right? So this was a I fine-tuned it. I didn't realize I was doing it, but I fine-tuned this vision because it brought me excitement. The idea of it was it brought me enthusiasm. And that is the greatest treasure map that you can follow, your feeling of enthusiasm. And I just remember picturing this, never believing really that it could be because it was like, you know, how is that going to happen? I had no concept of the future. I had no idea. I just knew I loved music, you know. Uh, but you become what you think about. And that's, what I, that's why I would attribute what I do today to the little dreamer. Yeah. Uh, and it goes on. It continues because your power of manifestation is in your ability to visualize and feel. You have to be able to feel it. Otherwise, it's mental lip service. And I recall when I was imagining this young, uh, this older Steve Vai when I was a kid, I didn't just create a pictorial. I felt it. I actually 
was like I was feeling it. I was fine tuning the visual, hearing it, and uh, that's how you do it. Uh, it I, I didn't know. It just happened. So I was in a rock band in high school. It was my favorite band ever. Well, maybe the band I was in with my little sister when I was six was my favorite. But that band in high school, Rage, was just, uh, first there was Circus with John Sergio and then Rage. And we, with Rage, we played all the rock stuff, all the clubs on Long Island. And what I remember a couple of milestones in my playing, I had this double neck guitar, Ventura double neck. I don't know what ever happened to that company or anything, but I would sit there on the floor with the guitar up like this practicing. And I, I never forget the day that I made the breakthrough where I could pick like this and I'd go, walk, I'll play fast, man. Yeah, it was great. And uh, uh, the, the, the thing that I didn't realize was the tone because the tone I paid very little attention to tone. I mean, the amp I was using was my sister's stereo with blown speakers that I rigged with a with the headphone jack. <laughs> you know, so tone was like the furthest thing. So as I was developing my style, I was actually developing some pretty bad tone. You know, my my picking technique was up here like this. All right. can't really do it now, but uh, it was this style and uh, also the way my fingers hit the strings, you know. I could play and notes were coming out, but it, it didn't really sound good. And I, was always, I would always wonder why all the other guitar players around in the other bands always sounded better. <laughs> you know, their tone was always better. No matter what amp I had or what guitar I had, I didn't realize um, what goes into actually making up your tone you know, uh, until I joined Frank Zappa's band. Okay, so uh, before that I was in college at Berklee College of Music and there's where I honed my chops because everybody there to me seemed like a monster player and I was the worst, <laughs> you know. Um, and really great players, very inspiring. I picked up so much and a lot of that was how complex can we play? You know, how, how, what, how difficult can the music be that we're gonna play, you know? And uh, Morning Thunder was the band and there was quite a lot of difficult music abounding. Many rehearsals, a great band, uh, at Dave Rosenthal, Eddie Rogers, Randy Coven, at one time we had Stu Hamm. But then when I joined Frank's band, I moved out to California, and I remember my style allowed me, or not my style, but my desire uh, allowed me to play all of these very complicated rhythms uh, and melodies that Frank would write. Because before that, he didn't really have musicians uh, who played a lot of that really odd melodic stuff that he wrote. And not, not musicians, guitar players, you know, not many of his guitar players, and he didn't play that stuff really. Uh, but I seemed to have an interest in it. And Frank would give me these incredibly dense, complex pieces of music. And uh, some of them were just sheer terror, you know. But there was this thing inside of me that felt, how could I fail if I don't give up? How could anybody? How could you fail if you don't give up, you know? This was my thinking, so, and I knew that if I started very slow and very patiently and learned every bar, beat by beat, and got it under my fingers at a slow tempo where it sounded really good and then slowly brought the tempo up, I couldn't understand why anybody could not learn something as complex as that if they just started slow and then slowly brought the speed up. Um, I still feel that way. You, you have to have the desire though. You know, I really wanted to do that. It was exciting to me, it was interesting. And it required, I mean, Frank's melodies are just like, uh, they're not meant for the guitar, you know? They're just obtuse on the instrument. And I had to figure them out. I mean, I can't remember it much of them, but something like. Oh. 
something like that, or the black page. And uh, I mean, that, that's a simple part. So I can't really remember that stuff it was almost 40 years ago. Uh, my God, it was 40 years ago. Huh. So, uh, and it worked, it worked good. Very interesting event took place after the first gig with Frank that uh, was a milestone in my career. We were sitting at breakfast the next day after the first show. Now I was, I had just turned 20 and uh, <laughs> you know, I was sitting with Frank Zappa and I said to him, uh, how'd I do? You know, how'd I do? And he said, well, sport, <laughs> I think you're a great guitar player, but your tone sounds like an electric ham sandwich. <laughs> and I said, well, why? I've got, the, I've got the gear, I've got the Strat, I've got the amp. And he said, the tone is in your head. Now, I never really understood what that meant. I thought it was just colorful wording, you know, uh, but Frank was absolutely correct. And it took a while before I discovered that. So at that time, like I say, I was really kind of just playing rock kinds of riffs and various modal things. And uh, it just, it, you know, it sounded okay, but it, didn't, it just didn't sound great. You know, it didn't have a rock tone to it or, or any real personality. Uh, and I remember I was a big Zappa fan when I was younger and I was listening to one of my favorite solos of his, which was Inca Rhodes. And he was doing this thing where he was kind of He was tapping on the strings with a pick. And we had never heard that. Or I had never heard that. And uh, I started to play around with the idea of tapping, you know, but I would do things like, you know. Uh, you know that was like the extent of it. And a couple of little other things. But uh, <clears throat> then when I was at college, uh, this, uh, before I joined Frank, Van Halen came out. And boy, didn't that change us? Didn't that change everything? When I heard his tone and I heard him tapping like that, uh, I was a big boy game, you know? And uh, it was great for all of us. And I definitely knew I needed to get my tone together. By the time I had uh, finished with Frank and moved out uh, to a, a house, a house that I had purchased in Silmar, I built a little studio. And this is where I created my first record, Flexible. And still, if you listen to Flexible, you can hear my, my style, that weird picking, kind of sloppy picking. Uh, and you can hear one of the other big attractions I had to the guitar on a psychological level, uh, it was the whammy bar. Because I knew in my mind, I just had instinctual understandings of what it could do. So at the time, uh, the, the, the greatest use of the whammy bar was uh, Hendrix, perhaps. I liked the way Brian May used it, but it was really dive bombs and effects and, you know, really cool kinds of uh, noises and stuff. Um, but I instinctually knew that there was a greater use for it, uh, or a different use, a different use also, because I love the dive bombs. And... Uh, I just started to mentally imagine various things that you can do with your fingers in the bar. And that has evolved through time. Uh, some of it you could see in the little jam I did. Um, that, that, uh, it's evolved and it continues to evolve. Continues every day because just like the little boy who was sitting in the room imagining ideas and then manifesting them and finding great joy in it, that's what I do today. And everything in my career that looks like the, the success has been a consequence of that desire. Because it's still number one. It's still the thing that gives me the greatest thrill, the thing that makes me feel as though I'm exercising my potential and my function, <laughs> you know? And that always feels great. And it's all about being creative and discovering new and different things. Uh, and I love sharing them. Uh, and there's so many players out there nowadays, as you know, that are just like um, phenomenal. They're just incredible what the way their technique, the technique has evolved. They're doing what I did in that 
when I opened my eyes as a kid and looked around into the world and saw what was going on on the guitar, I thought, well, this is what's possible, and this is where you start. I mean, you've got to work up to it, but that's basically where you start. And uh, that's how it works. It works beautifully. New ones come into the world, they see what's going on, and they go, oh, I got this. I'm going to take it here. You know, I can't imagine where future generations are going to bring the instrument. You know? But uh, going back to those early days of just sitting in my room and practicing, being very naive, very innocent, there was something in me, I, I recognize it now, even back then, that had an aversion to trying to play like somebody else, uh, to try to play conventionally in, in any particular genre. Okay, So what I mean by that is, yeah, I picked up so many Hendrix and Page and Beck and Santana, uh, Demiola, um, oh, the, uh, Richie Blackmore, I mean, it, it goes on. I picked up a lot of stuff from them. But whenever I would go to play, like in a solo situation or write a song, it never felt quite right to me to do their riffs or to, of course I did at times, you know, but it was always more rewarding to kind of find my own little riffs. And they were like my little secret because I didn't think I was great at all. I, I had no concept of being successful. I didn't care. I didn't, the, that whole idea scared me to death actually. <laughs> And uh, I just wanted to continue to explore, you know. And uh, I never, f back then I even knew that I wasn't going to be a very effective genre specific player like blues or jazz or classical. And I did, I played all these. I took lessons from a classical guitarist, from a jazz guitarist. and. Um, and I loved playing charts, you know, like I'd have these Joe Pass chord arrangements and I worked so hard on them, but when you get them, it's, it's like magic. It's like, it makes every day like Christmas, you know? It's just so great. Uh, but there was nothing really authentic uh, for me in it. It was fun and I developed great, uh, better chops for it. But I would always look for something odd, you know, that I was doing and then I would, like if it was a thread, I would just start kind of pulling it until I had enough thread to knit a sweater, you know? And uh, those were my riffs. And they, I, I look for them when I'm playing. I never thought that they'd be judged or heard or anything. Uh, but uh, once I moved out to California, as mentioned before, and I started to hear these great players, I knew I had to get my fingers together, I had to get my tone together. And then those words of Frank were reverberating in my head. The tone is in your head. And I know what that means. What it means is your tone is a reflection of the way you hear it in your own mind. Most people, they don't. Maybe not most, but many people don't. They just plug in and, you know, that's it. And I always um, try to delineate two dimensions of tone when I use the word. Uh, the first dimension of tone would be in the physical apparatus. You know, your amplifier, uh, the pickups you use, the guitar you use, the, all the accoutrements, you know. Uh, even and if you get really neurotic about it, you can uh, start changing cables and batteries and things like this to improve your tone. Maybe neurotic is a strong word, but uh, for those that like to explore those things deeper, I don't. Although I got great batteries and cables. <laughs> but I eventually started to take an interest in these things. Before, they seemed impossible because they were expensive. Yeah. But the, 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 the first, the primordial aspect of tone is based on how you're hearing it in your mind. How do you see and hear yourself playing? And when you have a picture of that, 
It has to start translating into the way you approach the instrument, the way you touch the instrument. And as many know, the tone of, a, of the way you hit a string or a note it varies by multiple um, elements, you know, just the way you hold the pick, how soft you hold it, if you hold it like this or if you hold it like that. You can, you can hit your string like, you could pull it this way. That's got a tone. You can hit it that way. You can hold the pick this way. You can hold the pick tight. You can hold the pick soft. You can pick here. It's warmer than here. So, and the way that you hit the note even, this all goes into your tone, your real tone. Because if you've got good tone, in your head and in your fingers, any instrument you pick up, regardless of the amp or whatever it's plugged into, you're going to work with it and make it sound as, as good as you can. So, and then I joined this band Alcatraz and uh, replaced Ingve. So when Ingve hit the scene, that was another awakening for a, a lot of us guitar players because he just had a Strat going through a Marshall, and his tone was amazing. And of course, his playing was a shocker, you know? So, probably in 83, after I made Flexible, I went through a, a total metamorphosis in my style. Because what happens when you start hearing yourself in your head differently, like I said, your, your hands will adjust accordingly. You know, you, you just find yourself experimenting, moving around and doing things that um, are approaching what you're hearing. And then it will even spill over into the first dimension of tone, all of your gear and things like that, because then you'll be looking for a specific sound out of something, you know. Uh, so that was actually when I also started recognizing the difference in the way amps sounded. Of course, I knew they sounded differently, but I just plugged into whatever I had, you know? <laughs> so this is, I started to, I changed my style completely. I went from this, uh, to, to more down here and controlled. And the tone really uh, changes, you know? And the other aspect of tone that was a great study for me was I just started playing very slow and listening, listening very carefully to just the way each note sounded uh, when I hit it differently. This is um, extremely important uh, to be able to listen to what you're, to, to hone in on it, even if it's just one note, you know? And then uh, I, was, I was fortunate because it worked. You know, uh, everything changed for me, my tone, and I started to make a conscious effort and tone is something that you continue to evolve. Uh, but then my playing style, one of the first things that I did of any real note in the guitar community was a song called The Attitude Song on Flexible. And this showed my, some of, the, some of my inner vision for what the whammy bar was capable of doing. Because at the time, um, they, I, I wanted to pull up on the bar. But no guitars could do that. I mean, you know, you know, the, the, maybe a Strat could get you, you know. You know. Uh, but then there was the evolution of the tailpiece, and the Floyd came along, and then the fine tuners, and then various kinds of tailpieces. Uh, but before that, when I was sitting in my little studio in Silmar, I couldn't understand why the bar wouldn't pull up. So I noticed that there was just some wood back here that was in the way of the bridge. So I actually took a hammer and a, and a screwdriver and I banged it out. And next thing you know, I'm going to Venus. <laughs> and uh, that was great because then I wrote the Attitude song and there's actual, that was one of the thoughts that I had is that you could play a melody with the whammy bar and a harmonic. And, and things like that. Uh, 
I would just look for different whammy bar techniques and fun things to do. Um, and this has never ended. So then as my style started to evolve, it, it kind of reached its, its comfort level uh, maybe when I was 25, 24, right when I was doing uh, Crossroads. And then when I joined Dave Roth, I was, I think my tone was more like that of a real rock uh, guitar player. And uh, from there till today, I just continue to explore the instrument. Uh, I love it and uh, do whatever I can, find uh, more and more interesting, mellifluous types of uh, playing. So, okay, there you go. A little bit about the evolution of Steve Vai's guitar style. So I, I'm going to play a little, I have a little video that I just made uh, that's got, uh, well, I was doing a, I was making an educational video on delay and I did this little jam and I'll play you that. It has quite a few whammy bar oddities, but uh, enjoy that. And hopefully next year uh, we'll be able to join the good folks at Sweetwater at their gear fest in person at that crazy, amazing facility they have, right? <laughs> and I know that you guys love to do that because it's a good opportunity to Get out of town and party. <laughs> but uh, thank you very much. Enjoy Gear Fest and um, thank you. <laughs>